stand ready for lunch. Ready for Autobahs at 4.30. It's a beautiful day here in Russia. Cold, just like Minnesota. Tuesday morning about 11 o'clock, car dealerships in Moscow 
also don't want any business. They have too much money. So I left each dealership with no, apparently there was no sales team. And all these dealerships have these beautiful women at the reception desk. I call them Christmas ornaments. Very attractive. They just sit there. I don't know why they're there, but they just sit there. And then I went to another dealership, a Mercedes-Benz dealership. And uh, finally, one person came up, you know, going into all the cars, sitting in the car. And one person came up to me, he was the salesman. So I took the most expensive car that I thought was really cool. I said, I'm interested in this car, what's your best price? He said, well, I can't make that decision. I have to talk to my manager. In the United States, nobody could hire him. He was, in my opinion, worthless. Okay. Uh, so four dealerships, and one person finally came up to me, and I thought he was worthless. So you got to develop some high standards built around customer service if you want to dramatically increase sales. I just did something bad. I'm going the wrong way. So let me walk through some principles that I think are pretty important. Doesn't matter what our business is. First, you've got to value, train, and develop your people. The first person that I saw were these beautiful young women behind these reception desks. And they used to have three of them. I don't know why you need three when none of them are doing nothing. So you've got to develop every single employee so they understand they're in customer service. Then you got to focus on the total customer experience. You have a lot of reasons why somebody comes to your dealership. It could be for an oil change. It could be for a tune-up. It could be because they damaged their car. It could be because they want to buy a used car, maybe a new car. Then you got to master empowerment. That means everybody in the dealership, every single person, has to be able to make fast decisions on the spot, and it better be in favor of the customer. And then you've got to eliminate costs, <coughs> pass the savings on to the customer. See, price is important for a lot of people. There are some people in the United States that they, they go onto the internet and they know exactly what the price is, they know what the price is the dealership pays, and they're not willing to pay much more than that. So, if you have 20 or 40 percent more employees than you need, you've increased your cost of operation and you're no longer price competitive. Now you have one advantage. Most of the businesses in Russia have too many employees. I found that in Russia, when you have a need to hire an employee, they hire two people. No one each that will give you only 50%. So when I went into my Lexus dealership, they have one person at the reception desk, and she's really good. She doesn't just say there, and by the way, they smile. Did you know that there is a law here in Russia that you are not allowed to smile? Putin made it. When's the last time you saw somebody here smile? It's like forbidden. So when I walk into a dealership, I would like these ornaments to smile. Is that difficult? So the first element of customer service, frankly, is to be nice, to smile. It shows work. But some reason you guys in Russia think that you're going to die if you smile. And then we got to eliminate stupid policies and rules and procedures. See, I found that in Russia and the CIS countries, you guys get down on your knees every night. You say, dear God, dear God, please give me more policies, more rules, more procedures. So the only one that likes the 
rules and policies and procedures as the owner. <coughs> Customers don't like them. They cost you money. They piss off the customer. Most of your policies and rules are stupid. Do you know that uh, one of the things I found in Kazakhstan, the former Soviet Union is strongly in place. I do a lot of business there. And I wanted to spend two weeks ago, this is just recent, 72,000 US dollars a year for three years, for a client of mine here in Moscow. None of the printers, 12 printers in Albany, were willing to provide the documentation that say that the materials were printed in Kazakhstan so we could ship it to Moscow. So instead, the client allowed us to print in Russia. And out of the 20 printers, Marina and my staff contact, set it up, never responded because here's the thing, I said, Roman, I don't know. Apparently, the economy in Russia is so strong, most companies don't need business. So we had seven companies that never responded. We had one firm that really worked with us, we're working with the owner. He already received a wire transfer last week from us. So what I find is a lot of companies don't need American money. They're fat, they're happy. They love the policies and systems and procedures that are so empowered. Another key, if we're going to be a service leader, we've got to reduce the friction. We've got to make it easy for people to do business with us. But instead, we create more policies and rules and procedures. You've got to dramatically improve speed. When I say the word dramatically, I'm talking about reducing the time it takes to get anything done by 90%. And then you've got to have operational excellence like Amazon did. When Jeff Bezos from, me, from uh, Amazon and Jerry Yang from Yahoo and Steve Case from AOL were asked, what is the source of your competitive advantage? They said, creating a customer experience. Creating a customer experience superior to anything my competitors can create. They didn't say price. They didn't say car, they didn't say design, they didn't say innovation. They said customer experience. So let me give you some steps to achieve awesome customer service. Number one, you've got to create customer-friendly systems, policies, and procedures. By the way, when I go into any car dealership in the United States, nobody, when I'm leaving the lot, checks my license and make sure I own the car I'm driving. Now, if that happened in the United States, you'd probably never have to worry about the customer coming back because nobody would ever go back to that dealership. So number two, you've got to master speed. You've got to do everything faster than you've ever done before. Uh, in some of the dealerships, I understand that it takes three hours for an oil change. Is that correct? So I asked Pat Bernanke, who's uh, the salesperson I work with at Lexus, how long it takes to send an hour? And I said, how long does it take to do a car wash? She said, 10 minutes. And then you got to reduce costs. Three ways to reduce costs. Pass the savings on to the customer, which gives you increased market share. See, one of the secrets of Amazon, why it's one of the most valuable companies in the world, is they're their fruit. They eliminate costs and pass it on to the, to the customer. But you can't buy cars from Amazon yet. The interesting in the United States, the car lobby is the most powerful lobby in the United States. Oh my God, are they powerful. They have, they've got Congress in their back pocket. They pass laws that you can't buy a car from the manufacturer. You can only buy it from a car dealership. In Minnesota, where I am, it's in the upper Midwest of the United States. And by the way, it's warmer here than it is in Minnesota. Uh, but they don't allow you to have a car dealership open on a Sunday. They passed a law. They got the legislature and the governor to sign it just years ago, and nobody, nobody's tried to change it. So you can't buy a car on a Sunday. Amazing. Uh, so three ways to reduce costs. One is eliminate all the stupid policies and procedures you have, because when you have a stupid 
policy. You hire another manager to make sure that it's implemented. And you pay the other manager more money. The second thing is you've got to eliminate underperforming employees. I wouldn't be surprised that everybody in this room, if you look at your total number of employees in your dealership, that most of you probably have at least 10% of your employees that are dead. And you keep paying them. What that tells me is that you've got too much money. You don't really care. So, dead employees are the most expensive employees you got because they turn off your customers. And then number three is that most dealerships have too many employees. So if you have more employees than you need, you're adding your extra cost. So you're, you have to charge more for your cars, which makes the market more limited. And then you got to train everybody in customer service with something new and fresh virtually every four months. You can't, it's just like an oil change. You can't say I did an oil change on my car 10 years ago. Well, that's how we develop people. We think we did something five or 10 years ago. Why would you train them again? Why would you have a new program? I did an oil change 10 years ago. Then you got to build a leadership team focusing on customer service. So the steps. So the question is, are your employees trained on policies and rules or principles? If I went into your dealership and I asked any employee, what do you do? Would they say I'm in customer service, or would they say I'm an auto body, I'm a, a service advisor? What would they say? If I went into one of your dealerships and I talked to the owner, would he say I'm a car dealership, or would he or she say I'm in customer service? It's a paradigm switch. So let's talk about the cost of losing customers the value of a customer over their lifetime. Most of us don't know the number of customer defections we have per year. And what's the total profit generated from that client? If you, if me, if some of you have my book, First Class Service, it's on page 63. So, so if you have a copy of this book, I would encourage you to look on page 63. And there's about four or five pages that describe the defection rate. So, what you want to know is what's the total annual profit lost due to customer defections. Now, later in this presentation, I'm going to talk about why I left different car dealerships. I bought a lot of cars over the years. In one of them, I went in because the car would die, and so I paid them like $103, and they said, we got it fixed. So a week later, I went back in, and I said, the car still dies. Can you fix this, uh, Michael? I discovered what the problem is. You have a bad battery. And we're going to charge you $25 for looking at the battery. They said, I'm not going to pay $25. They said, if you want your car back, you won't pay $25. So I obviously had to pay the $25. They didn't understand what the lifetime value of a customer is. Now, I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm not the world's best driver. And this car had a very low front end. In three different times, I crashed the front end of the car. Each time it was $5,000. Not rules. $5,000. Guess where I never went to fix the car? So they lost $15,000 in repairs. Plus, I never bought a car there again. I would never buy a car from them. I think they're out of business now. So most of us. We just look at, it's $100, we're going to fight over the customer for $100, $200. We, nobody knows the value of a customer. So the employees don't care. They know, how many here are owners of your dealership? Do we have any owners in the room? Okay, we've got a few, not a lot. They know that you're rich. Really rich. And so they, they, their attitude is, listen, this is Moscow. 
This is Russia. There's millions and millions and millions of people that are buying cars in this country. They're very rich people throughout Russia. If we lose a customer today, there's millions more we get to choose from. But maybe that's not true. So if we look at the cost of losing a customer, 68% of customer defection takes place because customers feel they're treated poorly. Probably 90% of the reason I don't go back to a car dealership is because of customer service. 95% of people who've had a bad experience do not complain. 13% to all 20 other people who have satisfied customer only tells five. It costs five times more money to buy new customers than to retain existing ones. But most employees don't care. They know that in your dealership, the owner is very, very rich. They know that you have unlimited marketing money. So they don't care. They're dependent on your advertising. A 1% cut in customer service problems could generate an extra $2 million in profits for a medium-sized company over five years. So if we look at the CLV, what is the customer's lifetime value? You should know that for your customers. Is it three years? Is it 13 years? Is it 20 years? How do you handle and take care of loyal customers? Do you make a loyal customer feel special? Frankly, from what I observe, in Russia, most people don't have a car. In my car? Most people in Russia that own a car are pretty well off financial. You might correct. Wealthy people expect to be treated better than anyone else. In Minnesota, where I live, or in the United States, you know, probably 90% of everybody, 95% of a car. Anybody can own a car. It's very easy to buy a car. And they're kind of inexpensive. So the question I have is, can you identify your high-value customers? How well do you treat your high value customers? I'm a, I fly out of Minneapolis, and 85% of all the flights are on Delta Airlines, and I'm in Diamond. I fly 125,000 miles a year, so I can call this 800 number here, and they'll answer the phone in about two or three breaks, and within about 15 to 20 seconds, a live person will come on the phone. They operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I could say, I'm flying out of uh, Moscow uh, in a few days, can you look at my flight? And they got it right in front of them. I don't have to say reservation number, I don't have to give the date, they got it. I could say, I'm flying to Denver later this month, can you look at my flight? They got it right in front of them. Okay. And they are empowered to take care of me. So, uh, it's probably the most valuable card in my building. Because I fly a lot, and I like to be treated special. In, you know, I'm sure that most of you are on planes a lot yourself. One of the things I find about flying is that it's miserable. I don't care if you're flying first class or not, it sucks. You have an airline in this country that has no grasp of customer service and no grasp of service recovery called Aeroflot. I'd rate it maybe a 3 and a 10 point scale. They're pretty bad. And on this trip, I didn't fly Aeroflot because the chances of them getting my luggage on the plane are anywhere from zero to zero. You gotta check in three days ahead of time for them to put your luggage on the plane. So defection management, do you know your defection rate? You need to know it in your dealership. If you can reduce your defection rate by 5%, you can have profit swings of 25 to 100%. Profit swings. If you can reduce your defection rate by 50%, you can double the growth of your business. So you don't need to add more people, you just need to have high-performing people that are just driven, and you can double your business. But we don't focus on keeping customers. How many in this room are from Moscow? Keep your hands up high so I can see. So it looks like about 75% or more. Okay. So this is a really big city. There are millions of people that live in Moscow. Now the real problem with the car in Moscow is you've got to find a place to park. 
And it's interesting, I've, I've been coming to Russia for 30 years, 35 years, and it's always interesting how people park their cars on the streets, on the sidewalks, on the fields. So if you want to focus on your infection rate, you've got to train the entire workforce in customer service so they understand that we're in customer service. Because the real reason people do that don't come back, don't buy a car from your dealership, don't go in for an oil chain, don't go in for body repair work is because your customer service sucks. Then you got to create a swap team. That's the, an individual or several people that can flip coins, that can do anything to take care of a customer. And then you got to list your actions you're going to use to reduce defections. Let me give you an example of the most customer driven company in the world because I think we can steal ideas from it, and that's Amazon. Jeff Bezos said our number one goal is to be the Earth's most customer centric company. And they are. How many here ever buy products from Amazon? Not too many? Man, I buy something from Amazon every week. See, in Minnesota, it's cold, a little bit like Boston. Okay? There's snow. Uh, right now, it's uh, a lot colder there than here. So why do I want to get in my car, go out to a retail store and buy something when I can sit at my rear end? Maybe at 9 o'clock at night, I can go to my iPhone or my computer and I can take 20 seconds and order something from Amazon and it's delivered either the next day or the day after. It's easy. And I get, I get, I pay less money. So we look at Amazon, the sales were roughly $178 billion last year. That's not Google, that's billions of dollars. Their sales went up 31%, $41.9 billion. The number one reason that people do not want to copy Amazon is because most companies don't need an increase in sales of $41.9 billion. Too much money. In a few seconds or a few minutes, I'll tell you the number two is. We have 566,000 employees. The past 21 years, the stock has increased in value 98,000 percent. Their stock price in the last three years has gone up 270 percent, 103 percent in the last 12 months. See, when you're awesome at service, people value you more. And by the way, they're putting a lot of companies out of business in the United States. So why would you go to Sears and get crummy service, slow service, lousy prices, when I could buy the same stuff at Amazon? So Sears will slowly disappear. Macy's will probably disappear in the next couple of years. Now, they got 180 million products. Jeff Bezos owns 20% of the company, and his salary is $81,800 a year. The richest man in the world. His net worth is $160 billion. The second reason people don't want to copy Amazon is because Jeff Bezos increased his net worth $60 billion in 2018. And most CEOs don't want that kind of growth. Too much money. Too many sales, too much increase in net worth. He said the number one thing that's made us successful by far is our obsessive, compulsive focus on the customer. They're the best in the world. He said there's two kinds of companies, one that's always trying to charge more and one that's trying to charge less. Amazon wants to be the latter. If you went into more day, most dealerships, everybody's probably trying to charge more. And Amazon, they're trying to charge less. He said efficiency and cheapness is part of the Amazon culture. He said we dramatically lower prices. He said word of mouth, look at these words, word of mouth remains the most powerful acquisition tool we have. You know that I wouldn't be surprised if each of your dealerships spends more money on advertising than Amazon does. You rarely see an ad on TV for Amazon. They just grow like lightning speed because they focus on word of mouth. Very few firms understand the power of word of mouth advertising. Now let me tell you, in order to have word of mouth, you gotta have awesome service. 
If you just got average service, there's going to be no word. If you have okay service, there will be no word. He said, we continue to focus relentlessly on our customers. And the key word there is relentless. What I found is that most CEOs focus on customer service sometimes for a year, sometimes for two, three years, sometimes for five years, and then they forget about it. You can never stop focusing on a customer. He said, selection, price, and convenience, including fast and reliable fulfillment, are their principal competitive factors. And this is probably one of the most important slides up here. Jeff Bezos said, if you want more of something, reduce the friction. Let's repeat that. If you want more of something, you want to sell more cars, more body shop work, more uh, repair work, reduce the friction. If you want less, increase the friction. So if you want less cars sold, increase the friction. Most companies have a lot of friction. A lot of it comes from rules, policies, and procedures. At Amazon, you can call them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're open for business. If I call them, they're going to first send me a text message that says, is this you call it? And I say yes. And then they come on with a live person after about 20 seconds. They can do anything they want. I have never had anybody at Amazon say no. Never. The first word most companies train employees to do is to say the word no. On my Amazon account, I got 12 addresses and 13 credit cards. I'm going to be going to snow skiing in uh, the 22nd. In Vail, Colorado, I got one of those addresses in Delaware because I always order something because I'm forgetting something. And everything is delivered right to my door. So let's review some principles at Amazon that I think you could use with your car dealership. Number one, everything's built on speed. So if I take my car in, I want whatever it is, I want it done fast. Everything is built around great service. They're awesome at service recovery. So when you screw up, they'll take care of you. They're incredible at the customer experience. They're always focusing on the customer. Think of those words. They are always focusing on the customer. Everybody. They're exceptional on empowerment. And the focus is on word of mouth. They're an incredible customer experience. I invested uh, in May of 2003, that's a long time ago, $1,000 in nine service leads. I had identified in 2003 nine companies I thought that were pretty good at customer service. Um, you know, I've been speaking and writing in a customer service market than anybody in the world. And what I found is the word relentless is that many of these companies are not relentless. So let's just quickly go through that $9,000. It's worth today $80,000. Amazon, that $1,000 invested in Amazon is worth $51,000. See, when you deliver this incredible experience, you increase the value of your business. So if you're the general manager of a dealership, you're the owner of a dealership, if you're interested in dramatically improving the value of the dealership, if you build a brand around the customer experience, it's more powerful. Home Depot, the stock is worth uh, $8,300. Uh, $8, the stock of Costco is worth $8,900. TD Bank, which bought out Commerce Bank, is worth $4,300. Commerce Bank used to be more valuable than Amazon, but TD Bank doesn't know how to spell the words customer service. Southwest Airlines is worth only $3,200. Walmart, the largest company in the world, it's only worth $2,400. The stock value in 15 years is going over. See, Sam Walt built a business on customer service and price. And in 2000, when Lee Scott took over as CEO, the first thing he eliminated is the focus on customer service. GE, the stock is worth only $597. They focus instead on greed, compensation for the board members, all greed. And the stock has gone nowhere. Under Jeff Emblem, when he was CEO for 16 years, 
After 16 years, the stock was worth less uh, when he left than when he started. And Dell, Michael Dell, the first time he retired at Dell, he, his new CEO is a money guy. Okay? Financial people always eliminate customer service. So the first thing they did at Dell is they eliminated the focus on customer service, and they never recovered. The stock now at Dell is worth 175 dollars. See, once you blow it, it's hard to recover. I'm working in uh, in uh, in Kazakhstan with Technica, the largest electronic retailer in the country. And the the uh, uh, for the last two years, human resources took over. You know, the whole focus on customer service, which was nothing. So they lost their their impetus. They lost their focus on customer service. Now they're going to get back to it in January. I just, I just did a, a seminar for him for the owner at Edward Kemp, but he understands the service strategy. So the key word I always tell an owner is the word relentless. And I find that maybe 5%, 2% of company CEOs are relentless. They think this is something cool to do for a few months or a couple of years. But what are you going to do at Amazon? You're going to say in 2019, we no longer need to focus on the customer's the value of the company the way down. So here's some steps on how to create a service structure. Number one, you gotta be a, you gotta have a vision as a service leader. Everybody in your dealership should know that you're in customer service. Number two, you gotta use technology to improve the customer service. Most companies use IDR. IDR means you push one for English, one two for Russian, and push three to go to hell. If you want to be a service leader, uh, you got to have a live person answering the call. Where's my young friend from Euroset that I signed a book for earlier? Where's my girl from Euroset? Where is she? I met, I don't know if you remember the name of Gany, of Gany from uh, Jerkin from Euroset, but when I first started working with him, now he lives in the UK. Uh, I said, I, I called your call center and it's pretty bad. And he said, so I spent about three hours with him and then uh, when I left, he called my partner at the time and he said, I want a job to call the call center. I called the call center and he wanted to bring the answer to the live person. I was pretty fast. Today, if you call Euroset, the answer would like to. So service leaders like an Amazon Use technology and Apple to improve the customer experience. Most firms use technology to piss off the customer. And number three, you gotta create customer friendly systems and procedures. See, at Amazon, it's really easy to do business with. Them. Apple, it's easy to do business with. Them. Number four, you gotta effectively build and develop the plugs. All of those. If you got 20% of your employees that are dead, how do you miss them up? And then you have, again, you gotta train all the employees. And then customers value exceptional service. How do they have They give you a lot of money. If you're interested in a lot of money, that's what my seminar is all about today, my presentation. You gotta demand excellence from your employees, and then you gotta compensate those who deliver great performance. You have to value your managers, your employees, and your customers. You've got to invest in them. You've got to demand leaders make decisions. In the U.S., if you can't make decisions, you're going to lose your job. You've got to track results. The service strategy can improve your sales, your profit, reduce defections. It can make you the most valuable company in your country. And the last, the most important words are you've got to be your lives. So most people in this room are probably thinking out some stupid American, what the hell's he doing? This is Russia. We got a different culture. I don't get a damn about your culture. Everybody in Russia loves a great customer experience. All the things I talk about, everybody in Russia loves. They just don't see it. See, going through the motions of providing service is one thing. Exceptional service, unusual service, with speed is quite another. So let me talk about why I switched car dealerships. I bought a 
I ordered a pilot. The salesperson at the time was really good. The place was about 25 miles from my home, which is for me a long ways to go to just buy a car. But one of the times we were renting a car in for servicing, somebody stole an iPod. The dealership was not willing to do anything about it. And then uh, the seats in the car are tan, and they, they uh, put special seat covers on them, so everything was tan, but on the back seat, it kept coming off. And they wouldn't repair it. So I stopped going to them. Now they have a brand called Luther. Luther owns maybe 20, 30 dealerships in the Minneapolis, Twin City, Minnesota area. I would never buy another car from Luther because I assume that one dealership that's got bad service is just as bad as all the other brands. I don't know how much an iPod costs, probably not a lot, but they were not willing to handle that, so we just never bought another car from them. And then my wife uh, wanted a Mercedes Benz. In fact, I think I was out of the country and she went and bought the car. She hated the car. Uh, they had really poor customer service at the dealership. And uh, I found the corporate headquarters for Mercedes really sucks at service. Now it's interesting because there's a lot of bullshit when it comes to customer service. Sorry, I'll be honest, you use that word. You've never heard of it. Um, but like in the last couple of years, there was this book written on Mercedes Benz talking about their incredible customer service. It's a fiction book. All fiction. <coughs> Amazing. And then I told you about the bad for $25. And then Audi, I bought four cars, so then they have the best service and great cars. But my wife wanted a Lexus. So we uh, went to the, uh, the Lexus dealership and bought a car. But every dealership I've ever left is because they had lousy service. <coughs> Now I got three cars I bought at the, this Lexus dealership in Wayzata. This is the last four years. And Pat Bernardo is the salesperson. He's the good looking guy on the right up here in the plane. By the way, can you text your salespeople at 6 in the morning? And they're going to respond. Uh, let's just see here. I text at uh, 5 after 6 in the morning, and he responded 50 minutes later, so a little bit before 7, because I had a question for him. And uh, then I sent him another text about uh, 7.36, and he responded at 7.40. And the question I have is, uh, I said, how long does it take to do an hour change? Because I had heard that in some of the dealerships in this country, it takes three hours. He said, one hour. And I said, how long does it take to wash the car? He said, 10 minutes. Uh, now, this car right up here is an RX Lexus. I bought that one uh, about six or nine months ago. And from Pat, that was my third car that I bought from him. And uh, I was going on a fishing trip with my son. I didn't know how to, it's a 4 by 4 I didn't know how to lower the seat so that it'd be flat. But, so I called him Sunday morning about 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, can you call your salespeople on a Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning? You can't. Okay, that's good. So all the people that bought cars from your dealership, the, the owners have the cell phone from the salesperson. They all have cell phones. Everybody knows the cell phone for your salespeople. Is that correct? So he said, I'm not quite sure where the, the thing is to lower the seats. He said, I'm only 10 minutes away when I come home. Would your salespeople do that? 
But see, I've spent maybe $150,000, $160,000 with him. He treats me as a value customer. I like him. I had him shoot this picture for me. I said, I'm going to use you in Moscow. But he delivers great service. He comes out to my house to set the, uh, you know, in the Lexus, you can uh, program it so you can open the garage door open. And I'm not technically real smart, so he came out with that. But he's really good.
AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile, and then you, they charge them the same strategy. So when you go into a T-Mobile or a Sprint or Verizon store to buy cell phones and Apple products, they have the same thing. They have a person that greets you. Up on the screen comes up your name, not a number at 257. Instead, it comes up your name. They use your name. Somebody approaches you and they use your name. Such simple technology. But I have not seen any banks in this country use technology. See, most banks don't want people coming into their stores. Most car dealerships, I think, from what I've seen, like ornaments at the front counter, but they don't understand the customer experience. So if you want to increase sales, you got to have high-performing customer driven employees. And one of the most valuable uh, things is your name. So self-imposed limitations are the biggest barriers to your success. So if you want high-performing people, you got to remove self-imposed limitations. Let me give you one last example of a service store model at some bank. I like to use banks for three reasons. Number, I like to use Commerce Bank and Bank. Number one, Bernard Hill, the founder, the owner, always gives me financial data instantly. Number two, everybody in this room has a bank. Number three, all banks suck at service. So Vernon Hill founded Commerce Bank in 1973 with seven employees. When he sold the bank in 2007, they had 10,000 employees. This house up here on the right left, that's his home in New Jersey. That's Vernon Hill on the right. Then in July 29, 2010, he started Metro Bank with 40 employees, and today they got 3,000. So let me show you some numbers, because this is what happens when you focus on the customer experience. The average, it doesn't matter for a car dealership or for a bank. Principles are the same. The average American bank branch has one to two million growth in deposits a year. Commerce Bank, his former bank, get eighteen million dollars annually. In Metro Bank, they're growing deposits. This is money that are putting in the bank. $98.3 million per year per location. The biggest obstacle a bank has is deposits. How do I get more deposits? By the way, if you have $1,000 to invest, you're going to get less money under your interest at Metro Bank than you will at the other banks. And they call them sticky deposits because people don't believe. Because they've never experienced that before. All banks in London suck at service. They're really bad. So at, a customer, at Metro Bank, they really take care of the customers. So they're growing 50 to 100 times faster than any American bank. I was in uh, Cyprus about a month or two ago, and uh, there was another speaker on customer service. And he was giving me the numbers on this bank that was so awesome in London. So I, I sent Bernard Hill an email and I said, who is this bank? And he said, it's a part of HSBC. And then I said, uh, what is the net promoter score for HSBC? And he said, like 18. And I said, what is it at, at Metro Bank? And he said, something like 85. I got, you know, you know how many so this guy is blowing smoke out my butt, telling me how great this bank is when it's a part of HSBC that has a really bad customer service. See, Metro Bank is the first new bank in London in 163 years. You're leaving me. Sir. Goodbye. They started with 75 million euros. There are, you know, there goes 100 locations. Their hours are open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday to Friday. On Saturdays, they're open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And Sundays, they're open from 8 a.m., excuse me, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Are your banks open those kind of hours? Is your dealership open those kind of hours? Now, I know that um, at Rolf, they have really good hours. I think they're open until like 10 o'clock at night. That's incredible. There's no dealerships in the United States with those kind of problems. Uh, is this what your banks look like here in Moscow? <coughs> so
So they call us free agent here. And that's because they're in the accountability business, which means taking business away from the competition. All calls in their call center are answered in one or two rings by a live person, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They open their stores 10 minutes early and they close 10 minutes late. Have you ever been to your dealership five minutes late? Do the, do the people just say, please come in? Or they say, no, you're going to have to come back tomorrow. So there's four ways to communicate with, with Venture Bank. You can go in store to Easy Out. You can go online. You can use your mobile phone. Or you can call on their customer. The best of every channel. So let me just summarize with some numbers of why it's important to focus on customer service. The average U.S. bank branch does well to open 25 new accounts a month. Commerce Bank opens 300 a month. Metro Bank branches are adding, it's that 1,000 is wrong, it's like 570 new accounts per month. And they have over 1.5 million retail and business accounts. They created 300,000 new customers from January through September. And they spend no money in advertising. No money in advertising. I'll bet you that every car dealership in this room spends a lot of money in advertising. And I know that where I live in Minnesota, oh my god, uh, car manufacturers, car dealerships, they spend more money on advertising. Oh my god, it's unbelievable the amount of money. So let's take a look at the financial numbers of September 30th uh, for Metro Bank. Total deposits have exceeded 19.2 billion. That's a 38% growth for the year. Remember, they started July 29, 2010. So this is this is uh, you know really is it seven years or eight years if we started in 2010? It's, it's eight years after eight years. Total loans have exceeded 17 billion. Total assets have exceeded 26 billion. They have 62 stores or 81 per month. It costs about 3 million dollars to build a new store. They're betting that speed and convenience make up for lower interest rates. So here's, is this what the lobby of your bank looks like? Now, I've been at a lot of banks in Russia, and I haven't seen a lobby that looks like this. So on their 10th anniversary, they expect to grow to 39 billion dollars of 100 stores and 2 million accounts. That's all focusing on the customer experience, no advertising. I get a media report every single week, it shows all the coverage that they have. They're in the media every day for free. So if you want to be a service leader here in Russia, you've got to have indispensable and extraordinary employees working for you. And you've got to build them and you've got to develop them. There is no educational system in this country that's going to train your employees and customer service. So if you want high-performing, customer-driven employees, it's your responsibility to develop that with your employees. And if you've got 100 employees in your dealership, or 200, or I don't care, or 50, you better be developing every single person in your dealership. So let's quickly talk about how do we motivate employees to care. Number one, you've got to drive the stuff emotionally. See, I believe in Russia, the United States, every country in the world, there's not one person that does not know customer service is important. Not one person. They just don't do it. So you can drive this stuff emotionally. Number two, you've got to focus on skills and techniques. You've got three seconds, two seconds. The customer can tell in two to three seconds if you care or don't care. Then you've got to focus on personal work. You've got to build people from within. Most employees have problems with their girlfriends, boyfriends, their spouse. Some people live from paycheck to paycheck. You think they're so excited about anything. They there's a lot of negative things that happen in people's lives. It's your responsibility to build and develop your employees. Then you've got to teach the boys how to handle right great customers in difficult situations. See, when something doesn't work, the employee doesn't come in in a nice manner that says, oh, will you please fix that? He says, you stupid idiots, don't you have any brains? He starts raising his voice. 
and he can be tough. What I find with a lot of employees, when there's confrontation, we cry. We get emotional and we toss the customer back. Каждые 3-4 месяца должны проходить новые программы. Потому что 
И они должны быть разные. Если вы провели один тренинг, люди позвонили, и потом падают. И очень важно поддерживать это обучение постоянно. Я, я сам постоянно развиваюсь, постоянно сам развиваюсь. Получается, что самые главные три вещи – фасилитация на месте, тренинг, э, энтузиазм, э, риск уважения коллег, третий – Джон Да, мы используем технологии для того, чтобы обучаться. И сервис Квалти Институт, который, собственно, создал Джон 40 лет назад, он помогает. И они развивают именно развитие людей через это. Именно постоянное обучение, разве так, как тогда работает. Все, что вам нужно, вам постоянно нужно развивать своих людей. И uh, давать им возможность развития не только их разных, но и карьеры. Ну, смотрите, если вы поступили в колледж, вы же не получите диплом, если только один курс учится. Then we have 25, 40 percent employee turnover in our dealership. Да, да, понятно. Мы понимаем, что у нас есть оборот, текучка 20, 25, может быть 40 процентов. So you're not constantly building and developing people. Мы должны все равно развивать людей. In a matter of years, you're back in ground zero. И это очень важно. Сегодня, кстати, Джон Вармон. Сегодня задали нам один очень важный вопрос: через сколько можно запускать человека на фронт линии? Ну и тут вопрос в том, он сказал, что в Америке продавцы, которые работают непосредственно в дилершипе, это самые квалифицированные, самые профессиональные люди, готовы ответить на любой вопрос. То есть есть явное непонимание о том, кто должен работать на фронт Давайте поговорим о скорости. в России. Все программы основаны на видеоматериалах, в которых эм, показывается либо позитивная, либо негативная коммуникация между людьми и то, как нужно делать. И именно на этом построен весь основной принцип обучения сервису, который проводит Джон. Я думаю, что вообще самое главное, самое важное в работе компании это скорость. Скорость это значит вот сильное, скорейшее, максимально быстрое увеличение. Заработал? Заработал, так что Продолжаем. So speed means that it normally took you 14 days. How do I do this one day? If it takes you three hours to do an oil change, speed is how do I do it in 30 minutes? Uh, I have a lot of oil changes done in my car, so I get this little guy that's me in the mix. And he charges me uh, typically $20 to do an oil change. It takes about 15 minutes. I would never... My present Lexus, you got a bunch of free oil changes, so I had my wife take the car to run around town. But if the other guy, I just wait because it takes 15 minutes. Boom, 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 he's done. He doesn't wash the car, but he's a small old guy. I've spent a fortune over the last maybe 10 years or so on his first customer. See, I'm not the best driver in the world, so I have a lot of action. And if you turn all your action and send it to the insurance company, they charge you a lot of money. So I get him to, to you know, do a lot of the work on my cars. So culturally and socially speaking, it's not in our nature to think we speak. Think about when you were in college. It's Monday morning. The professor says we're going to have a test on Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning. When did you start studying for the test? Thursday night, or was it Friday morning? So, the difficulty we got with the employees is that the employees all have a slow mindset everywhere in the world. They think slow. And the second thing is we have policies and procedures that are designed to be slow. 
So the speed does not for go quality for the sake of finishing faster. It shows people you can over deliver any purpose. So if you have body work you're doing on a car, and you promise the guy that it's going to take three days, you better get it done in three days, ideally in two days. And then the other core skill that I think is really critical, and we've got about 20 minutes left, is you've got to have a power. That means every single person in the dealership has to be able to make fast decisions in favor of the customer. You don't teach employees to say yeah, you teach them to say no. It has to be part of their vocabulary. And I find that getting an employee to make an empowered decision, even for 50 rubles, takes two miracles at one time. You're never going to be a service leader without empowerment. There's too many weird things happening all the time. I have never had Amazon ever tell me no. See, Amazon is not interested in the profit from the immediate sale. They're interested in a long-term relationship. So there's three reasons we don't use empowerment. 90% of the reason employees will not use empowerment is because of what? What's the number one fear that an employee has? They're, you're afraid you're going to steal something? No. What's the number one reason, number one fear, I'm not going to use your power? You speak English? Beautiful. Uh, punishment. No. What's the number one reason? Lose of control. Repeat? No. Not lose of control. What's the number one reason nobody will use your power? What is it? What did you say? Oh, okay. What's the number one reason? It takes longer. It takes longer. No. Lack of trust. No. Come on. It's so obvious. Too lazy. Too lazy. No. What's the number one reason we will not use the power? I know it's fear. That's what we said up here. What's the number one fear? What is it? The number one fear, the number one fear is the employee knows they're going to get fired. And most people don't want to lose their job. They don't want to go home that night and tell their spouse they lost their job. If you know what the fear is, then you can start to solve the problem. This is a worldwide issue, it's not Russia. It's Everywhere in the world, including the U.S. Second reason we don't want to use a phone. You gave the guy a free oil change. You're paying for it. It's coming right out of your side. Why would I want to spend my money? This is too risky, so I'm not going to do it. The third reason is you stupid idiot. I can't believe you're that dumb. Why would you have done it? We don't want to be chewed out. So you have to push people to make empowered decisions. You have to reward them. You have to make a big deal out of them. If you have internal publications, highlight it every issue with people that are making wild and power decisions in favor of the customer. <coughs> if you ever fire somebody for making an empowered decision, you'll never have any more power. But it is the single most difficult thing to get employees to use, and without empowerment, you have zero chance of being a service leader. There are too many weird things that happen every day in your dealerships. And you've got to have people that can make fast decisions in favor of the customer. Watch this video. Я могу вам помочь, сэр. Мне не просто сын и чистку и цели. О, извините, у нас только что закончились. Я могу предложить вам что-нибудь еще? Ну, тогда я вас пожарю на цыпленка. Мне очень жаль, но у нас ничего стоится сейчас нет. Раз так, мы предлагаем вам в качестве публицации бесплатно про то, что приедет. Тогда дайте мне сэндвич с рыбой. Хорошо, с вас 4 доллара 50 центов. Годится. И спасибо за картошку. Я за что сейчас вас уже готов. 
Но у нас закончилась острая курица. Немцы не были раздражены, поэтому я рад ему немного картошки в сэндвиче. Я не хочу не за то, чтобы перестал раздражать его. Я не люблю. Он был только что дал ему то, за что он не заплатил? Да. Ты уволен. Вы шутите? Нет, я не шучу. Я не 
that customers tell everybody about it and they fall in love with you. So service recovery is how do I take a customer from hell to heaven in 60 seconds or less? How do I get a customer that's swearing at me, pissed off, really upset, and in 60 seconds flip them when they think they're dealing with the greatest company in the world? Would you like to learn how to do that? Okay, nobody wants to learn. We'll skip it. How many want to learn? Okay, now we're getting better. So there's four things we're going to do. We're going to act quickly. When I talk about service recovery, it has to happen in 60 seconds. That means you don't have time to move it up the chain of command. The employee at the point of contact best implements service recovery. Number two, you've got to take responsibility. What you want the employee to do is say, we screwed up, I screwed up. You don't place blame. You don't say it's accounting. It's the service advisor. Yeah, it's the people in the body shop. Oh, it's that sales department. Don't make excuses or lie. In the United States, 80% of employees lie when there's a problem. They're hoping nobody will remember who they talk to. Don't point out customers misunderstanding. And don't place blame on other people in the organization. When you tell a customer, sir, I'm sorry that I can't help you because at our dealership, we have policies and procedures and systems. It is like putting gasoline on a fire. It becomes very explosive and you're going to lose a customer. Third is you've got to be in power. And fourth, you've got to cut it. You have to give things away that have high value, low cost. Sir, I apologize that the oil change took 30 minutes longer than normal. It's our fault. Because of the additional time, we balanced your wheels at no extra cost. What are the things that have high value, low cost, that you can give away? If it's too cheap, it's like sloppy the person. There's no value. So what are the products, what are the services that you have that you can give away that have very high value so the customer falls in love with you? And it has to happen by the frontline employee. That's what I call compensation. Does that make sense? So in every one of your dealerships, there's lots of stuff that you have that has high value, low cost. You should have them identified so that every employee has five or 10 things they can immediately give away. But again, if you give a guy a hat that has no value, you're slapping the guy. There's no high value and low cost. What are the things that have high value? Those are the things that you want to give away. Be generous. See, bad word off can sink you faster than a Titanic was sunk by an iceberg. Social media today can become viral. So the last couple minutes, we're going to talk about handling irate customers. You've got to listen carefully. Put yourself in the customer's place. Ask questions that address their concerns. Suggest alternatives. Apologize without blaming and last solve the problem quickly. Watch this video. Двойные хата картошка три сладкая, рулет с морской солью, одна диетическая, одна обычная и яблочный пирожок. Спасибо. Что-то не так? Вытер, подери право, что-то не так. Не дарили сладкую картошку, у меня две обычные. Извините. Знаете, вы уже достали. Здесь работают они не образованные идиоты. Я прихожу сюда, может, раз в месяц, и всегда здесь что-то напутают. Я не... Это фастфуд, гамбургер и картошка. Что тут сложно? С новым меню иногда... Вас же это много обучали, правильно? Да. Я надеюсь, вы понимаете, что слова «сладкая картошка» стоят перед словом «сыр». Да. Тогда в чем проблема? Всего-то нажать кнопку на компьютере и кинуть еду в мешок. Ведь они не могут справиться с вашей работой, и, возможно, сделал бы это лучше. Хорошо, хорошо, давайте я дам вам вашу Нет, я уже сказал. Возьмите двойные картошки, напитки. Я ничего не хочу. Мэм. 
Знаете, я инженер, я очень много зарабатываю. А кто вы здесь? Менеджер? Удачи. После такой ситуации нужно сделать паузу, восстановить силы, чтобы оказать качественный сервис следующему клиенту и обрести способность удачно маневрировать в другой сложной ситуации. Putting you down, calling you names. I don't know if in Russia people would ever swear. Do people swear in Russia? Yeah. They do. Okay. And do not let the power of your position go to your head. I'm the manager here. Well, you know, that's like, again, putting gasoline on the hire. So if you understand the lifetime value of a customer, And if all employees know the value of a lifetime customer, you're not talking about hundred dollars. Maybe the, the discussion is over some a hundred dollars, US dollars, okay? And the employee is fighting for that hundred dollars. But maybe the lifetime value of your customer is four hundred thousand dollars. But no deals. So the employees are gonna say, this is a hundred dollars. They know the owner of your dealership is going to starve to death if they let a hundred dollars slip out of their hands. They don't realize that when they fight that customer, it's four hundred thousand dollars that's disappearing. So you need, and starting on page 63 in my book, First Class Service, it talks about the lifetime value. Go through that formula. I used that formula of the plasma business in its hundreds of millions of dollars. I'll bet you that in every dealership in this room, if you understood the lifetime value of your customer, you're probably talking, if you could cut your defection rate by half, you're probably talking $25, $50 million a year in dollars per dealership. Huge money. But nobody cares, nobody knows. Because they know that the owner has unlimited money, unlimited money for advertising. We know we have billions of people in Russia that can buy cars. So who cares? need to understand this. So your unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between fact and fiction. It takes whatever you say at face value. So you've got to believe in yourself. I had a chance to work with Stanley Marcus when he was alive. He was the founder of customer service in the United States. He had a chain at the time called Neiman Marcus, which was a role model for incredible service. They have the highest prices, the highest level of customer service of any retailer in America. Mr. Marcus said we have to respect our customers. Second, you have to learn to love them. And eventually, you will adore them. If I can get everybody in the room and every one of your employees to master these principles, you'll all make a lot of money. You will have rapid increases in sales. Autoboss will help you become more successful. It's up to you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My contact information is right here. If anybody wants to communicate with me in Russia, they can talk to Marina and my staff. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. Roman up here at Zinko is my partner here, so you can talk to him. And if anybody's interested in our Russian products, Roman will be at the reception desk where we got some of our products on sale, or you know, then you can take a look at it see if you would do. So, Tatiana, thank you so very much for inviting me here to talk to Коллеги, буквально одну секунду, пока все организуется. На ресепшн Джон представил все свои продукты, которые помогают вам научить любое количество людей, вашим же сотрудникам. Его технологии предусматривают именно, что обучают ваши сотрудники, ваших сотрудников. Подходите на ресепшн, потом мне все более детально расскажу. Сейчас, Роман, секундочку, мы сделаем одну фото. Я думаю, что... Спасибо огромное. Спасибо. Этот молодой человек выглядит как Андрей Арбатович. Спасибо, спасибо. Спасибо. Сейчас все, кто хочет получить автограф в ваших пакетах, есть его книга на всякий случай, если вы еще не заметили. Все, кто хочет получить автограф, у вас будет сейчас такая возможность. Если можно, вот за этот, сейчас мы за этот стол посадим жену, потому что у него сегодня была травма колена. 
Я вообще не сказала, что это такой прыгал, воду крутил, но сейчас будет уже сидеть. Выстраивайте в очередь, говорите свое имя, говорите по-английски, по-русски, мы будем все переводить. Если у вас есть личные вопросы,